Hello students, welcome to another video lecture for ComSci 125 operating systems. In this chapter, we're going to uh, look into propor proportional share scheduling, but before we proceed to this topic let's have a short review on what we discussed in the previous video so in the previous video video we focused on the MLFQ or a multi-level feedback queue wherein the processes are, are, are assigned to a specific queues and there are multiple queues with different priority levels and over time the execution uh, during the execution of the process the process will move or migrate from one queue to another thus altering its priority the advantage of having MLFQ is that the scheduler doesn't need to predict the remaining time of the running or ready or running processes so this way the there is less state that needs to be maintained by the scheduler now let's move to this proportional share scheduling what do we mean by this so this is also known as a uh, fair share scheduler. The idea is that uh, each process will have is guaranteed a certain percentage of CPU time. So remember in the previous videos we talked about different metrics so in we talked about turnaround time, we talked about response time. And we also touch briefly uh, fairness and this is the scheduler or the policy that addresses fairness now how do we implement this fair share scheduling the idea is to hold what we call a lottery in a lottery we usually have tickets and the tickets will represent the share of a resource that a process should receive the more uh, we usually say that the more tickets you have the more chances of winning then we represent the percent of tickets uh, as the share uh, of the system resource for that particular process as an example if we have two processes A and B and process A has 75 tickets if we have 100 tickets all in all then process A will have a 75% share of the CPU and if process B has 25 tickets then process B will receive 25% of the CPU now how do we approach this uh, fair share scheduling using lottery so in this lottery scheduling, uh, what happens is the lottery will, ha will happen every time slice. So processes will be given time slice, a time slice or a quantum to run on the CPU. And then when the time slice expires or is completed, then lottery will happen. The scheduler will pick a winning ticket. So remember that 
lottery involves uh, randomized or basically it is probabilistic and it will run the process the scheduler will schedule the process that holds the winning ticket so let's have an example if you have 100 tickets and process A has 75 tickets with numbers 0 to 74 and process B has 25 tickets with numbers 75 to 99 so after the completion of each time slice the scheduler will perform a lottery in this uh, timeline here at this point in time the scheduler selected ticket number 63 and looking back at the given ticket number 63 is held by process A therefore A will be scheduled to run on the CPU then after the time slice after A has completed its time slice then the scheduler will perform another lottery and let's say this time it got 85 and 85 the ticket number 85 is being held by process B therefore process B will be scheduled to run on the CPU and the process continues until all of the processes have uh, completed their executions the longer these two jobs compete, the more likely they are to achieve the desired percentages. So it is uh, the way to achieve this fair share scheduling or to be able to obtain the percentages, the process should be uh, long running processes. As an aside, why do we choose randomness? There are several advantages of uh, randomness. The first one is it avoids strange uh, corner case behaviors. Since this is probabilistic or randomized, so you don't know what you will get, then uh, there is an opportunity to get out of certain corner cases that might be problematic in the long run. The second advantage of randomness is that it is lightweight. When we say lightweight, we maintain very uh, only a few information to be able to perform the scheduling. In the example here, we only need to know the ticket numbers being held by the processes and that's it. All we have to do is to compare whether the ticket drawn uh, is being held by a, spe by a specific process. The third uh, advantage of randomness is that it is visually fast because generating a random number from a generator is typically fast and it is often supported by the hardware. Now, if we have a lottery, uh, lottery scheduling, we can actually provide some mechanisms regarding the way we process the tickets. The first mechanism is called ticket currency. Now, the idea of uh, this ticket currency mechanism is that a user in a multi-user system allocates tickets among their own processes in whatever currency they would like. So let's call it uh, local currency. Then the system converts this local currency to the correct global currency value. For example, if we have 200 tickets, which is the global currency, and then process A has 100 tickets, 
based on the global currency and process V also has 100 tickets based on the global currency then user A when giving tickets to the processes let's say we can say that user A will give 500 tickets to process A1 and user A will give 500 tickets to process A2 these values here represent the local currency and this local currency will be converted to global currency during the scheduling mechanism process so this way the user A has some flexibility on how it manages its local currency in the case of user B here user B gives uh, 10 tickets uh, local currency to B1 and this will be translated to the 100 global currency that is allocated to it initially the second mechanism ticket mechanism is called ticket transfer a process can temporarily hand off its tickets to another process so this way you can transfer the tickets so that if you have higher priority peer process or process you can assign more tickets to that this is useful in client server applications with server doing tasks on behalf of the client so the client will usually transfer more tickets to the server to give higher priority or higher chances of winning to the server thus higher chances of being scheduled then the third ticket mechanism is called ticket inflation the idea here is that a process can temporarily raise or lower the number of tickets it owns this way if any one process needs more CPU time it can boost its tickets now if we allow this scenario it's possible that it can be abused by some malicious processes so the assumption for this ticket inflation mechanism is that the group of processes trust each other how do we implement this lottery scheduling let's take a look at an example here let us say that there are three processes a b and c and there are 400 tickets in total this pertains to global currency the current draw returns the winner with the ticket number 300 this is how it will look like in the ready queue or the run queue so we have head we have the three jobs or processes jobs a b and c or process a b and c and these are the allocated tickets so if you sum this you get 400 tickets in total how do we implement this lottery scheduling so as shown here we have 18 lines of code we have line 2 we initialize a variable counter to zero and then we get a winning ticket so in this scenario we have 300 then we have a temporary node I will assume that you are familiar with linked list especially with traversing a linked list so this temporary node here will be used to traverse this uh, list then we have while current counter while current would mean that we haven't reached the end of the list what will happen is we increment counter with the current number of tickets so initially current will be 
pointing here then counter will be counter plus the tickets so currently counter is 0 so 0 plus 100 that will be 100 and there is a condition here that checks whether counter is greater than winner so 0 plus 100 that will be 100 which is lesser than 300 so what will happen is that current will move on to the next node so current will uh, let's denote C okay. so at this point the counter is 100 then we go over we go inside the loop again since C is not yet null then we add counter which is 100 and we add uh, current number of tickets for process B so we have 150 then we compare is 150 greater than 300 so that is false so what will happen is counter will move to the next node and this will be 150 and what will happen next is the same so we add 150 and 250 that will give us uh, 400 and this condition 400 is now greater than 300 therefore we're going to exit this while loop and current is pointing to process C therefore process C is the winner and thus will be scheduled so as you can see we have uh, this list this is an, this is an unordered linked list so we can actually think of other possible optimizations to speed up the process of determining uh, the winner for the lottery how do we evaluate the performance of lottery scheduling so to do that we define a fairness metric f this is the time the first process com uh, completes divided by the time that the second process completes example if we have two processes and each process has a runtime r of 10 the first process finishes at time 10 the second process finishes at time 20 therefore the fairness is 10 which is the first process uh, the time the first process completes divided by the time the second process completes so we have 0.5 f will be close to 1 when both jobs finish at nearly the same time now there is a study of uh, the fairness of lottery and this is shown in this graph to be able to generate this graph we have this sample scenario and assumptions we have two processes with runtime or job length r ranging from 1 to 1000 so as shown in the x-axis and there are over uh, 30 trials made then each process has the same number of tickets 100 using the fairness metric we defined previously okay, given these two processes given uh, two processes this is the plot that we get so we have the fairness here in the y-axis and the job length here what can be observed here is that when the runtime is very long so in this uh, range the average uh, fairness can be quite severe as shown in this graph which approaches one for uh, long-running processes 
So it says here that f will be close to 1 when both jumps finish at nearly the same time. So the, the next question that we need to ask is how do we assign tickets? One approach is to assume that the user know, uh, users know best, thus we simply let the users assign the tickets. So here, here are your tickets, process A. Here are your tickets, process B. You two processes do your job. But of course, this is still an open problem because we need to properly define the procedure and the total number of tickets to allocate for each process. That's why it's still an open problem. The next approach is called stride scheduling. In the previous approach lottery scheduling, we use a randomness or a probabilistic approach. But this time, we are going to use what uh, we call a deterministic fair share scheduler. The main issue is that randomness occasionally will not deliver good results, especially for processes with short run times. So, an alternative is, uh, is proposed by Wild Spurger and this is called stride scheduling. We define the stride of each process. What do we mean by the stride of each process? The stride is defined as some large number, so this is an arbitrary number, divided by the number of tickets of the process. For example, uh, in the previous discussion on lottery scheduling, let's use a large number, say 10,000, as the numerator here. And let's say process A has 100 tickets, then the stride of A will be 10,000 divided by 100, which is 100. In the case of process B, since it has only 50 tickets, then the stride will be 200, 10,000 divided by 50. Now, having identified this value, when a process runs, we increment a counter, a variable counter, also known as a pass value, for it by its stride. So initially, it is 0 and then we increment it by the stride value for that particular process. Then the algorithm will simply pick the process to run that has the lowest pass value. In pseudocode, this is how it will look like. We have current, which removes the minimum from the queue. The minimum would be the one with the lowest pass value. Then that process will be scheduled by the scheduler to run on the CPU. Then the current pass, uh, the pass value of the, the process that has just finished will be incremented by the stride of that particular process and then it will be inserted back into the queue. Let's have a, an example on how this works. Here we have three processes, process A, process B, and process C. We have computed the stride or pre-computed the stride to be for process A, we have 100, for process B, we have 200, and for process C, we have 40. So we decide now who runs. So during the first iteration, since all of the pass values of the processes are zero, we can select an arbitrary process to run. Let's say we select A. After the completion of A, 
then based on the pseudocode that we have here the current pass value will be incremented by the stride so the current pass value is zero so we increment it by the stride amount so we now have 100 here while d and process c their pass values remain zero then the algorithm will select the minimum now, since we have pass values of zero for both d and c then we can arbitrarily select d for example then during this iteration after the completion of b we increment the pass value of b by 200 that's why we now have 200 here the pass value of a did not change because it was not executed as well as the pass value of c then on the next round the minimum pass value will be scheduled to run so in this in this round the minimum is zero so that is process c so c will be uh, scheduled will be selected and the pass value of c will be updated after execution while the pass values of a and b will remain the same now during this round we see that a c still has the lowest pass value so c will be executed so the process will continue until all the processes have completed their execution so the main issue with this setup is that if a new process enters with a pass value of zero it will monopolize the cpu because it will always have the lowest pass value in this scenario lottery is still better since there is no global state to be maintained per process when we say state as i mentioned earlier this refers to the information that needs to be stored monitored updated after every uh, during every or during scheduling decisions so here we have to maintain we have to maintain the stride and then the pass value so that these are actually overhead and thus the lottery scheduling is better in this case now the third approach that we're going to look into is an actual implementation and this is implemented in linux systems it's called the linux completely fair scheduler the goal of this scheduler is to fairly divide the cpu evenly among all competing processes it uses a counting based technique called a virtual runtime remember that processes will have actual physical runtimes on the cpu in the cfs there is a property called for each process called virtual runtime which ideally approximates a theoretical uh, execution uh, um, processes in uh, a hypothetical processor as a process runs its v runtime increases so it will be updated as the process runs and its growth may be the same as the physical time so there is a difference there might be a difference but the growth the growth rate may be the same when the scheduling decision time occurs the scheduler will pick the process with the lowest v runtime so this is the primary variable that will be used to select the process that will execute on the CPU when uh, it uses a periodic timer interrupt 
and can only make decisions at fixed time uh, time interval so there it hooks to a timer interrupt then it has a specific time interval that performs uh, that will be uh, triggered so that the scheduling decision will have to be made so if we have this periodic timer interrupt then uh, it is not affected if the time slice is not a multiple of the interrupt timer, timer uh, interval time remember the in the round robin policy the quantum should be a multiple of the interrupt timer interval time in the case of cfs there is no dependency or there is no restriction on the uh, quanta or the time uh, the time slice because it uses a periodic timer Now to be able to control the behavior of the scheduler or of CFS, we have some control parameters. The first control parameter is called SCAD latency. This determines how long one process should run before considering a switch. Okay. The typical values uh, is uh, 48 milliseconds so take note that it will determine how long one process should run before considering a switch so essentially is the time slice for a process uh, the time slice for a process is computed as the scheduler or scheduled latency divided by the total number of processes for example if we have four processes then the time slice would be if the value is 48 milliseconds that would be 48 divided by 4 then each process will be given 12 milliseconds as its time slice to run on the CPU the next control parameter is called the minimum uh, granularity this is to address uh, too many processes running because as you can see here when n is very large the time slice becomes small so basically it's some form of a threshold so that the value or the time slice will not be too small the minimum time slice for a process despite a large n is typically set to 6 milliseconds so if you have uh, this uh, set of processes and the resulting time slice is less than 6 milliseconds the time slice that will be given will actually be 6 milliseconds now uh, CFS provides uh, a mechanism to allow users or administrator to control process priority so it allows users to influence the priority uh, of the processes and this is via weights waiting and uh, this is uh, usually referred to as the niceness of a process so niceness is a, a value is a variable that can be controlled and the range can be from negative 20 to positive 19 a positive nice value means lower priority while a negative nice value means higher priority what happens is that these nice values are actually mapped to weights in a table so in the source code of the linux kernel there is a mapping or there's a variable that maps the priority to the actual weight values for example negative 20 a niceness a nice value of negative 20 
this will be the weight for negative 19 this will be the weight so this is the weights table then although in here the computation of time slice, uh, time slice is simply the scheduled latency divided by the number of processes if we introduce the nice value then the time slice will not simply be the scheduled latency but rather it will be the weight based on the table of this process k divided by the sum of all the weights in the set of processes that are running and then multiplied by the scheduled latency originally it simply it was simply scheduled latency divided by n but since we introduced niceness this will be the new way to compute the time slice by incorporating the nice values then the v runtime which is an important variable will be updated also we said that the v runtime is the virtual runtime so for a process i this will be the original process uh, the previous v runtime uh, plus the weight of the initial uh, the weight uh, the initial weight okay, the this is the default weight value the uh, weight zero is the weight for a nice value of zero so for a nice value of zero the weight is one zero two four so this will be one zero two four divided by the weight of that particular uh, process the niceness multiplied by the actual uh, runtime so let's have an example here so we have the scenario we have process a with nice values of negative five so this is a high priority process since the nice value is negative and the process b with nice value of zero how do we compute the time slice we simply use this formula so first we need to determine the weight of the process given the nice value with a given nice value so process a has a nice value of negative 5 so we look at the table negative 5 the weight is 321 so that's what we get 320 uh, 321 this is for this value okay, 321 divided by the the sum of the processes that we have the weights of the processes that we have so we have uh, 3121 plus 1024 so that will be 4145 and we multiply that by the scheduled latency that's why we get 36 milliseconds this means that process A will have 36 milliseconds to run on the processor on the CPU whereas for process B since the default value is 0 then that will be 1024 divided by 4145 multiplied by 48 giving it 12 milliseconds to run on the CPU as for the V runtime this will be the formula that we're going to use this will just simply be the V runtime of A plus uh, weight of niceness 0 so 1024 divided, divided by the weight of 
the process for that nice value, so 3121 multiplied by the runtime of A. So these are variables. So it's, there's no constant given in this example, but the idea is that the computed V runtime of A will accumulate at 0.33 the rate of the V runtime of B. What does this mean? This means that A will have a smaller V runtime and will have higher priority because in the CFS scheduling algorithm, we pick the process with the lowest V runtime and during the scheduling process, A will, be, will have the smaller V runtime and it will be given uh, 36 milliseconds as a time slice. So the next question is how do we efficiently, which means as quickly as possible, find the next process to run? Remember that our main criteria is to find the process with the smallest V runtime. Now we can have several approaches to do that. We can have a linked list, but we have to traverse the entire list to find the minimum V runtime. We can sort the list, but sorting takes some time also. And the list is dynamic. So a solution implemented in CFS is called the, red, the implementation of, or the use of red black trees. In COMSI 123, you learned about height balance trees. We talked about the binary search tree. And for height balance trees, we have the ABL tree, for example. So red black tree is uh, similar to the AVL3 in that it tries to make sure that the tree is height balanced, meaning that there will be a logarithmic uh, search time compared to the linear search. What happens in CFS is that CFS places only running uh, runnable processes on the RB3. So here we have an example. We are given uh, 10 processes with V run times 1, 5, 9, 10, etc. If a sorted list is used, the next process to run is simply the first element, as I mentioned earlier. However, inserting a new process will need the scan of all items in the sorted list in the worst case because you have to place the new process in the correct position, in the correct sorted position. So that will be a problem. So a better solution is the use of the red black tree. The idea of the red black tree is that different levels will have uh, different colors. So that must be that property must be maintained. That's that one property must be maintained, and the keys in the three RB three are the V run times. So in this setup, to be able to find the minimum, we go to this side of the tree and we extract this and then we adjust the properties or the tree later to, main, to maintain that it is height balanced. How do we deal with I.O. and sleeping processes in CFS? What is the implication of these types of processes that are doing a long I.O. and are sleeping for a long time. The idea is that when these processes are awakened, meaning their state is changed to ready or running, 
these processes may monopolize the CPU since its VRAM time has not been updated for a while because they are sleeping. Remember that the VRAM time is updated with the value of the actual runtime. But since these processes are sleeping, the V runtimes will not be executed, uh, will not be updated. Therefore, they will always always have small values in the for the V runtime and they will always be in this side of the tree. So the solution is that we alter the V runtime of newly awakened processes by setting it to the minimum V runtime in the RB3. So you get the minimum and then here comes a new process, newly awakened process, set the V runtime of that process to 1 because currently 1 is the smallest V runtime in the RB3. Processes sleeping for short periods of time will not get their fair share of CPU. So CFS is the default scheduler in Linux and there are other fun stuff about it and you can take a look at the source code of the Linux, Linux kernel and then try to uh, experiment with it if you, have, if you are interested. Again, I emphasize that in learning systems, operating systems, or systems in general, the best thing to master the topics is to try the commands, try the programs on your own. So here are some other stuff about CFS that I will not discuss in detail. Uh, some heuristics to improve performance, handling multiple CPUs, which we will discuss in the next chapter and scheduling for process groups. This scheduling for process groups is important in uh, containers like Docker and uh, LXD. Okay, so there. Okay, so we're down to the last slide for this chapter. I'll just like to show you some of the Linux commands that you might find useful in relation to the scheduling topic. So the first command is man sched shown in the in the slide we have man sched. So let's take a look at the VM. So if you look at man scale, okay, you see a description of the CPU scheduling in Linux. And let's take a quick uh, run through of this. So we have a few of the API that are available for scheduler, for the scheduler, to get access to the scheduler. So we have in Linux we have what we call scheduling policies. It says here that the scheduler is the kernel component that decides which runnable thread will be executed by the CPU next. So remember that we are talking here about processes being scheduled because at this point we are assuming that a process will have one thread only so there is a one is to one mapping but in the succeeding chapters we're going to talk about a single process having multiple threads of execution and it is important to understand that usually the what is being scheduled are the threads so in the description here you can see that the documentation refers to the thread which actually pertains to the thread in execution so it says here that each thread has an associated scheduling policy so that's one value and then 
a static scheduling priority called schedule priority. The scheduler makes its decision based on the knowledge of the scheduling policy and the static property priority of all the threads on the system. Uh, for threads scheduled under one of the normal scheduling policies, so we have so each process has a scheduling policy. How do we uh, view the scheduling policy? So right now, I am running uh, MAN because we are reading the documentation for the scheduling policy. So this is the process ID of MAN. We can use the command uh, chrt minus p to determine the scheduling properties of this so it says here that each thread has an associated scheduling policy so it says here for this process the scheduling policy is scheduled other which is actually the cfs scheduler and then it has a static scheduling priority called scheduled priority which is zero now we can use this command chrt minus m to tell us the to, the to know the minimum and maximum priority so you can see here that the priority is actually used only by the FIFO and the round robin uh, scheduling policies it says here that for threads scheduled under one of the normal scheduling policies scheduled other scheduled idle scheduled batch scheduled priority is not used in scheduling decisions so it's not uh, shown here processes scheduled under one of the real-time policies scheduled FIBO scheduled RR have a scheduled priority value in the range of 1 to 199 as shown here okay. so I will just leave uh, you or I just let you explore this man page to learn more about the scheduling policies of Linux but let's proceed at some more examples so in the discussion earlier we talked about control parameters in the CFS so we have we described two control parameters we have scheduled latency and uh, mean granularity how do we view the, the values for this uh, control parameters in the Linux system so we can use the sysctl command CCTL minus A will show us the uh, list of tunable kernel parameters, but we are only interested in the scheduling component. So uh, we need to filter that using the grep and then. let us also look let's figure that in the reverse manner for the domain and this is what we get So we need to use sudo to be able to view the details okay so we see here some of the parameters 
So let's take a look at here. So we were talking about the SCAD latency and here is the SCAD latency. NS means nanoseconds. So the SCAD latency is uh, 12 million nanoseconds and then the granularity the minimum granularity again in terms of nanoseconds is uh, this is 1 million 500,000 uh, nanoseconds for the uh, minimum granularity what else uh, okay let's take a look at the niceness of a, of a process So if we run the, let's just use the, cpu.l example. And then we look up top. So we see here we have the, we can use the ps command also. So we have the priority 20 and then we have the niceness of zero. Now let's take a look at the scheduling policies policy, policy used for first let's get the process ID of hello uh, of CPU that uh, so we have 4588 then So this is the uh, scheduling policy, scheduled other, and the priority is zero since it's not actually being used. So if you look at top, this is what we get. Okay? The priority is actually computed uh, differently, as we will see later. So we can use the nice uh, command to change the niceness of the process so let's say let's uh, run it to have a negative 10 niceness and if we get the new process Four eight seven six. So this is the same, and then if you look at the top, right? So you will notice that the niceness is now negative ten, and the priority is ten. Okay. So how do we change this back to zero? So we can use sudo. use the nice command and then when we look at top we now change the value of uh, this process so that's the idea right if you want to uh, if you want to use PS so we'll get this information for this particular process. Okay, uh, we can also look at the uh, 
proc file system to debug the scheduler. So this allows us to view the status of the scheduler. So we have uh, scheduler clock, CPU clock, uh, kernel time, and then here we have uh, the actual system scheduler process okay. and this is the CFS run queue okay, for uh, essential services okay. uh, and this is what we are interested in what are the tasks that are in the run queue or in the ready queue so we have here so these are uh, the process states okay. so other information include uh, the name of the process the process ID the tree key so remember that the key in the RB3 for CFS is the V runtime the number of context, context switches priority the priority assigned uh, here is 120 meaning these are system processes then some wait time and uh, other parameters if we're looking at okay, so we're look so we're using cut here uh, we're looking for our process cpu.l okay so cp this is a two core processor this vm has two cores that's why you can see that it has run q0 and run q1 which we'll discuss for multiprocessor later but you can see here this is the process cpu l and this is the process id for 876 this is the value on the rb3 this is the column is this uh, the number of switches number of context switches so it has a lot of context switches and then the priority etc so by looking at this particular uh, proc file in the proc file system we will be able to view the state of the uh, scheduler you can also take a look at the sched stat but it has uh, it only places or displays raw values without any uh, interpretation but you can do some research on this now what if you want to look at the specific scheduling properties of cpu.l Can take a look at the sched parameter and this is what you're going to get let's see if this changes okay so we're processing this or watching this uh, code change so you can see that cpu.elf has this is the process id and it has one thread only and then this is the time or start of execution this is the currently v run time that we have for this process uh, number of migrations okay. I will discuss about migrations later and then we have the number of switches context switches and we have the there is no voluntary switches context switches only involuntary uh, switches and then we have other parameters regarding that are related to the scheduling of this process okay so press control C or to stop that 
Now, what if we want to change the scheduling policy of uh, CPU.elf? How do we do that? So, remember that we use the chrt minus p. Scan other means CFS. What if we want to change it to round robin? So we can actually do that. Uh, and simply change that to R, and then we set the priority to let's say 10. Remember that for the round robin we have 1 to 99, and then if you look at uh, so you can see that we were able to change the scheduling policy of the process to round robin and the priority is 10 so then we look up top so notice that the priority is not the one that has no relation with uh, the niceness so it is negative 10 because it is computed uh, differently Okay, with that, we end this chapter. See you on the next lecture video.